want you to hit me as hard as you can. If you've ever wondered what attending a film school is like, almost half of your time there is spent debating and discussing movies with classmates. Conversations that go into great details, like how and when DC films will eventually overtake Marvel, but also broader conversations like top 10 films of the year, top 10 disappointing films of the year, or even more challenging, top 10 of the decade. Eventually your professor would overhear the conversation and inevitably tell you about the year 1939 the greatest year in the history of film. Its lineup of films was the murderer's row for cinema lovers, as evidenced by the Oscar nominations the following year. While we've had some overall weak entries that have somehow snagged nominations over the past decade, that year's nominees include Dark Victory, Withering Heights, Of Mice and Men, Stagecoach, Love Affair, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, Gone with the Wind, and perhaps the most beloved of them all, The Wizard of Oz. You remember, the story of a young farm girl named Dorothy who is whisked away to a magical technicolor land where she kills the first woman she encounters, meets up with three social outcasts, and sets off to kill her first victim's younger sister. She's, she's dead. You killed her. It is remembered as one of the most beloved films of all time, and is regarded as one of the greatest films ever made. It is one of the 25 films that kicked off entries into the National Film Registry, and according to the Library of Congress, even though I'm not quite sure how anyone could ever track this, it is the most viewed movie in history. Right now, generations of your family hold this film in the highest of regards, and yet only a few, if any of them, know the history behind the making of this classic. We've been hitting up a lot of films from the past few decades, so why would we choose The Wizard of Oz? The answer is simple. With today's current climate in filmmaking, from the Me Too movement to equal pay to safer working conditions, it's simply mind-boggling to know that a film so beloved was made under the circumstances of The Wizard of Oz. If you're wondering why, we'd answer because of on-set accidents, because of horrible working conditions, because of toxic makeup poisoning, because of studio-prescribed drug abuse, because of an on-set sexual assault, and rumors of suicide. Just because. Because, 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 because. So take a step back, click those ruby red slippers together, and leave Kansas in the rear view as we absolutely destroy what you thought you knew about the Wizard of Oz, and ask the ever so obvious question, what the f*** happened to this movie? Back in the studio system days of Hollywood, MGM had a trusted troubleshooter, someone they could call on to save the day for a film if production wasn't going the way higher-ups wanted. In 1939, Victor Fleming was called in to save two of their most expensive productions. One was the Oscar-winning film Gone with the Wind, but first, Fleming had to take on the highly ambitious and extremely expensive The Wizard of Oz. Before Fleming, the film had a revolving door of directors who all proved ill-equipped to handle the daunting task of bringing L. Frank Baum's popular novel to the big screen. The film already had dozens of writers and producers, huge sets built by hundreds of carpenters, and a cast that numbered in the thousands. Nevertheless, he came in with a confidence that the picture could not only be saved, but that it could thrive. Fleming was often known to say, obstacles make for a better picture. It's worth noting that he was known to say this before he stepped into the director's chair on The Wizard of Oz. There were so many problems on this set that it's almost impossible to include them all here, let alone address them in order. So we're going to give it a shot anyways. The film star, Judy Garland, is probably the best place to start. In 1938, Garland was cast as Dorothy in the lead role. MGM saw her as a girl next door type, and she was often cast in roles to match that persona. To keep up with the harsh schedule of the film, the studio had prescribed her amphetamines to keep her awake during the long and lengthy shooting schedule. Even though she maintained a healthy weight, the studio demanded that Garland remain on a diet. There are stories from set of Garland ordering a regular meal from the commissary, like her male counterparts. When MGM caught word of the order, they'd cancel it and substitute her ordered meal with a bowl of soup and a plate of lettuce. Eventually, the studio started giving her tobacco to suppress her appetite. She quickly developed an addiction to these drugs that she was told were necessary in her profession. Because of the lasting effects of the amphetamines that helped her maintain MGM's shooting schedule, she often missed out on quite a bit of sleep. Not long after filming began, she was also prescribed barbiturates to help her sleep when she needed to. 
Thirty years later, in 1969, barbiturates would also be the cause of her death in a self-overdosage. With the world fixated on the Hollywood sex scandals that arose over the last few years, it's worth noting that this intolerable behavior was tolerated on sets and show business for decades before it came to light. The Wizard of Oz was no exception. Garland was subjected to the same type of behavior during filming. At the time, she was only 16 years old. Studio head, and perhaps chief culprit of those she accused was co-founder of MGM, Louis B. Mayer. He would often compliment her on her singing, claiming that her performance, unlike others, came from the heart. He would accompany that compliment by groping her to show her where the heart was. Another executive that Garland wouldn't identify demanded that she have sex with him, like so many other female stars at the studio had. When she refused, the executive promised to ruin her career in return. All of this was told in a biography that wasn't published until 2009. The biography itself was at one point optioned for a movie, where Garland would be brought to life on the big screen by Anne Hathaway. The movie never actually made it into production, as its very own executive producer was soon hounded for committing the same type of behavior for decades. That producer was, you guessed it, Harvey Weinstein. I know such things should be discussed, but it doesn't make it any less depressing. Let's transition from Garland to the Munchkins. Surely something so joyful and happy couldn't possibly be controversial or derogatory in any way. So what were we, funny little weirdos? <laughs> to make you laugh? Oh no, no, not at all. What were we wearing? <laughs> what? What were we wearing? <laughs> The stories of the munchkins behind the scenes of The Wizard of Oz have become the stuff of legend. So let's break down what was actually real, starting with the man that assembled them, Leo Singer. He was an agent in Hollywood who specialized in what he called, uh, please forgive me, midget entertainment, and promised the producers he could bring in 124 little people, all under 4 foot 4, all white, that the studio required. While he made the numbers, he lied about the height, as many of the little people he brought to set were deemed too tall. Those actors were rejected and replaced, but because of his dishonesty, Singer's pay was cut. This resulted in him taking $50 from each of the Munchkin's weekly wages for the duration of the film. The Munchkins were only being paid $100 a week, so Singer was taking half of each of their wages. This is a huge insult when you consider that Toto, Dorothy's dog, was pulling in $125 a week. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. If that feels like a smack in the face to you, imagine how the munchkins must have felt. Such low pay is bound to have an impact on performers. Judy Garland used to tell interviewers that the Munchkin actors would drink every night to the extent of being completely smashed. There were rumors that every night, the Munchkins would carry on until the morning, drinking, fighting, engaging in prostitution, gambling, and having Caligula-like orgies. Wow. Sounds like quite the party. In terms of the fighting, there was one day of production where a little person named Charles Kelly showed up on set with two loaded pistols. He was angry because he felt that the mayor of Munchkinland, played by Charlie Becker, was flirting with his wife Jessie. As it turned out, he was right. Charlie Becker and Jesse Kelly married in 1940, a year after Oz was released. So I guess we can add cheating, adultery, cuckolding, or whatever that situation was to the list. Perhaps the worst of all of the Munchkin rumors goes back to Judy Garland herself. When her ex-husband had a posthumous memoir released a few years ago, he alleged that Garland was repeatedly molested by some of the little people on set. Men of 40 years old, constantly putting their hands up the dress of a 16-year-old girl. It's possible that these stories were blown out of proportion. After all, the rumors of Munchkin committing suicide on set have persisted since the release of the film even though the image described has been proven to be a bird over and over again. Throughout decades, nearly a century now, the truth can be stretched very far without many people around to correct it. The rumors of the Munchkins' behavior was very upsetting to the little people themselves. They denied all of the claims and argued that they worked very hard for very little pay. Regardless, the Munchkin allegations remained one of the low points of the troubled production. 
There were so many stories of this type of behavior on set, it's actually really hard to name them all in one video. So if you have a favorite that we missed, sorry to let you down. The types of problems covered so far still persist in Hollywood today, but the industry has improved since the days of Oz. Guarantees of hours and time off, which is unfortunately still ignored a little, came out of the decades where actors didn't have those benefits. So did the guarantees of a safe workplace, because in Oz, conditions were anything but safe. The actors realized this right away, as the lights on set reached 101 degrees Fahrenheit on most days, but the real nightmare started right when Dorothy arrived in Oz. After meeting Glinda the Good Witch, she comes face to face with the Wicked Witch of the West, played by Margaret Hamilton in one of the most memorable performances in the history of film. Fans remember her arrival in the movie very well, but her departure in that same scene is what Hamilton remembered the most. You see, there was a trap door that wasn't rigged properly and was meant to be Hamilton's disappearance from the shot. While she wasn't in the frame by the time the smoke cleared, the fiery exit left its mark as Hamilton suffered a second degree burn on her face and a third degree burn on her hand. After taking a few weeks to recover, she returned to set on the condition that she not be involved with any pyrotechnics on set. Producers were fine with that condition, as there were very little pyrotechnics left in the film. A stunt actress, Betty Danko, was hired for what pyro was left. While shooting the surrender Dorothy skywriting sequence, Danko was seated on a smoking pipe that was made to look like a witch's broomstick. During the initial take, the pipe exploded. Danko went on to spend two weeks in a hospital recovering from the incident, and her legs were permanently scarred from it. A second stunt woman was brought in to finish the broomstick sequence. The shot looked pretty good though. Ultimately, Hamilton returned to set and finished out the role as intended. What wasn't intended was the green tint on her face weeks after shooting concluded. Turns out the makeup used for the Wicked Witch was copper based, which is life threateningly toxic. She accidentally licked it at one point, ugh, which caused her to be nauseous for over a week. Which is lucky considering that paint is fatal if ingested in a slightly larger dose. Hamilton finished out her time on the film, but finished it all on a liquid based diet. Believe it or not, the makeup nightmares don't end there. Ray Bolger, who also served up a legendary performance as the Scarecrow, was originally cast as the Tin Man. Wow, that is a fun fact. It'll get worse before it gets better. Bolger wasn't happy about the casting decision. He felt his limber performing and loose dancing would serve better as the Scarecrow, and that the Tin Man would be too stiff for him. So he actually convinced Buddy Epson, the actor originally cast as the Scarecrow, to switch parts with him. Now, you may be saying to yourself, hang on, Buddy Epson? The Buddy Epson from Beverly Hillbillies? He wasn't in The Wizard of Oz. Right you are, viewer. And that's because nine days into production, Buddy Epson was hospitalized because he was unable to breathe on his own as a result of the aluminum powder in the Tin Man's makeup. It happened on set. He collapsed and struggled to breathe. Members of the crew stood around and watched helpless as he was close to choking to death in front of them. When he was taken to the hospital, he was placed in an iron lung for two weeks as his lungs were completely coated with metal, which made it difficult for oxygen to flow through his body. Once he showed signs of improvement, he moved to an oxygen tent where he remained for another two weeks. The cast wasn't even told what happened to him, and they assumed he was fired after he was replaced. The studio, believing Ebsen was faking it, replaced him with Jack Haley and replaced the aluminum powder with aluminum paste, just in case. So after one actor was hospitalized for their makeup, no one thought to check the makeup of other actors? Are you serious? I'm dead serious. Hell, even the ASPCA was on set to make sure the makeup used to turn horses green, which was just jello powder, was safe for the horses to ingest. But it's okay. After the long, life-threatening nightmare Epson endured, MGM was sure to make it up to him by keeping his voice in one of the songs he recorded before almost dying. At least the cowardly lion didn't have to put up with any of this. The actor who portrayed him, Bert Lahr, may have been the only cast member who escaped unscathed. He just had to wander around the set in a 60 to 90 pound costume. 
because it was made from real lion hide. So, finally, I think we've covered all of the unsafe conditions on set. Oh, wait, one last one. The fake snow that covered Dorothy in the field of poppies was actually asbestos, just cloudy with a chance of asbestos. But in the end, you know what they say, you can't argue with results. Except the results weren't that magical. While The Wizard of Oz received tremendous acclaim upon release, it brought in a measly $3 million during the entirety of its theatrical run. Considering that the film had a $2.7 million budget, that's barely any return at all. When you add on distribution, along with the huge marketing and merchandise campaign MGM put out for the movie, including clothing, soaps, and code hangers? You understand that the studio wanted to push Oz as far as it could possibly go. Unfortunately, the film ended up being a $1.1 million loss for the company. Ten years after its Oscar success, Oz was re-released in theaters. By this time, Judy Garland was an international star. The film's themes of overcoming evil and the importance of home seemed to be exactly what audiences were looking for in a post-war America. It wasn't until this release in 1949 that Oz recouped its losses and became a profitable film for MGM by about $50 million in today's money. What took the film from successful to iconic was the advent of television. MGM sold the rights to televise Oz to CBS. The price tag was $225,000 per broadcast. Its first broadcast was on November 3rd, 1956, and debuted with a 33.9 Nielsen rating. That was roughly around 45 million viewers. CBS aired the film again three years later, and brought in even more viewers than its previous showing, thanks to moving its airtime up one hour. Knowing a success when they have one, CBS negotiated a deal with MGM to air the film a third time, and eventually, the deal turned to an annual special event for the network. These annual viewings continued for decades, until the 80s, when Turner Broadcasting purchased the MGM library, which leads us to today, where The Wizard of Oz can be caught on TNT, TBS, and Turner Classic Movies sporadically throughout the year. Today, critics continue to regard it as an absolute masterpiece with groundbreaking visuals and deft storytelling. It has earned a 98% on Rotten Tomatoes and a score of 100 out of 100 on Metacritic. It's listed as number one on AFI's top 10 fantasy films of all time. About a year ago, after compiling data on over 47,000 films, The Wizard of Oz was named the most influential film of all time. The scene that transitions from a sepia-toned film to a technicolor work of art ranks high on numerous lists of most memorable movie scenes. Its success led Judy Garland to a new contract with MGM, and a hefty pay increase as well. She'd go on to become one of the top 10 box office stars in Hollywood, and earned an Oscar for Best Juvenile Performance. The film was nominated for a total of 10 Academy Awards that year, and brought home two Oscars. It won Best Original Score, and Over the Rainbow would go on to win come to life. Oh, we're off to see the wizard, the wonderful wizard of Oz. 